Delaware County, of course, signed that same proclamation. After the Civil War, they never re-signed the proclamation or rejoined the Union. Little known fact, but it is true. All right, that operated. How many people called your name? Do what? How many called your name back there? Who? We have a class going on next door. Yeah, Sorry. 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 Who he sat beside me lunch? Who? Maybe he is. Hey, Mike, do me a favor. Jim, go run upstairs real quick and double check. Who was next? Dave? Between? Mike, Dave, Jim? All right. You won't miss much. We're going to rock into this. Next control, three master, traffic top, whatever you want to call them. Remember, they're the one who decides who and when things happen. They're in charge. Never be afraid as a net controller to use to, quote, crack the whip. Clamp down on the net if you need to. You need to tell the net to silence, you tell the net to silence. When you hear the word silence put over a net, that means exactly what it says. Silence. We don't want to hear anybody key the mic. Until that net controller removes silence off the net, nobody talks. Sometimes they may do that. If they get overtaxed, they may just come out and go silence. That gives them the opportunity to catch up, to get what they need done. The only thing that breaks silence is what? That's it. be located anywhere as long as the net control can hear all the stations involved. Do we necessarily need to put the net control at the EOC? No. no. And in some cases it's best not to do that. Net control might actually be this room back here. Okay. That might be the point for net control. Everybody including EOC goes through that. In the initial phase, it might be downtown and then get moved out as things expand. It's just going to depend on what we've got going, on the size and scope of the operation, and the intensity of the operation's tempo. How about a backup net control station? Think we need that? Yes. Why would we need a gym? I like the dance move back there. That was cool. Appreciate it. I'm going to tell household six, you don't have a dance. Uh, she knows all right. Good deal. All right. Back of net control. It's a good idea to have one, even on VHF, UHF net. Because what can happen? Radio failure, power failure, person failure. Person failure. <laughs> Maybe the. The primary gets overrun and you need the backup to help them write scenes down or something. Well, that's kind of difficult. You know, that's possible, but it, it, it's really more towards what Wayne was talking about. We lose an antenna, we lose a radio, we lose a power supply. We can't lose function. the operator. The operator loses. He passes out because he has an eight and ten hours. Okay, we're going to get to that in a minute. Always good to have that backup. Okay. The EC or OXCOM manager or whoever gets put in charge of the initial call on operation will make that determination and they may assign that alternate net controller. Otherwise, the NCS, whoever happens to be primary, may say, hey, I need an alternate, you're it. Then you get asked, so that's why you need to practice doing what? Running the net controller. Control. You need to practice this. I will suggest strongly to you that it is a perishable skill. 
it is a perishable skill. We talk every day individually. New place, station to station, right? No problem. We can do that all day long. We can do that in our sleep. Try doing that with 20 or 30 other stations. Try controlling them in emergency operations tempo. It gets challenging. So without practicing it, and even though the Thursday night net runs about 30 minutes and you might check in 20, 22 stations, it's still that process of checking them in at tempo. It gives you an idea of what it's like having three and four stations call you right at one right after another. You start working then, you practice that. That helps out. Okay. All right, let's see here. The second station, different location, maintain a duplicate log. Why do we log things? I'm going to talk about logging in a little bit. Ooh. We know the time, the date, and the event that's happening. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, happen. it's a record. Everything we do in emergency and disaster operations from a communication standpoint, everything we do is public record. It has to be documented. All of our, everything, we got a document. We made it a little easy at the EOC because we use a computer system. But you still got to document this stuff. And the idea is, one, liability. Somebody says we didn't do something. No, we did. Here's our record. We got it. <clears throat> we can also reconstruct the event later. What did we do? What didn't we do? What should have we done? Should we have done this differently? What worked? What different didn't work? So we can reconstruct it later on. The exercise that I went to on Wednesday at the State OC, they actually took real-time stuff that occurred during Florence, and that's what they exercised with. Wow. Through the same scenarios, but at different counties and at different groups, and it it was intense. Okay, if you're acting as a fill-in net control station, you're there to assist that net control station. But here's a couple of do's and don'ts. You're not God. Treat people with respect and accept suggestions. I'm on the fence with that in a couple of ways. One, you're always going to have that person that does what? Well, I like that, whatever that was. <laughs> you're always going to have that one person to go, I've been an amateur radio operator since God created radio. Yeah. So I know more than you. Yeah, but you haven't done anything in emergency operations or any training. You get zip training. How do you know more than me? Okay. You're always going to have those instances of that one person that's going to do that. So as a net controller, you just got to handle that. Best thing to do anytime there are any type of discussion is do what? Take it offline. Go to the phone, put it on the phone. That way it's not on the air. Right. Because some people will take and they will try to intimidate a net controller. If they don't like, if they don't think you're doing the right job and the job you're supposed to do, they will come in and try to take over, thinking they can do better. All that does is create problems. Yes, they will. Okay. I want everybody to nod your head when I say this. If that happens to you, contact me immediately. Let me know if that's happening. I will deal with that individual. And they will not like how I do. Because no one, nobody's going to abuse anybody out here. That's my privilege, is the least. Don't put the no in there. <laughs> we all know you mean it. You're pretty good. <laughs> I have fun with every one of you. I don't abuse you. I just have fun with you. And you guys give it back as good as I give it. So we're good. Okay. See the scars on. <laughs> if you're taking over the existing net, try to follow whatever that previous net controller was doing. Do not shift ears. 
What happens when you do that? When you come in and go totally different procedures, totally different methodologies? Throw everybody off. It's confusion. People go crazy. And all. And the biggest thing that happens is frustration. In disasters, frustration occurs. Okay. I want you to think about this. You know, you've already done your primary thing. In any disaster, before you deploy, what's the first thing we do? Take care of ourselves. Take care of ourselves and family. You make sure mom and dog and kids and, and everything else. In Wayne's case, it's the dog and then the wife. Um, priorities. You know, gotta have the priorities. Yes. Right, straight. You know, you make sure who everybody's okay, and then you deploy. But where's your mind still going to be? Part of that brain's where? Oh, back home. You're still concerned, even though you know they're okay. Because you did that preparation, you still got a little bit of that in your brain. It's always going to be there, and that's called love. And you can't get rid of that during a disaster. So frustration occurs. Do everything you can to not confuse the people in the field. Keep it as close to normal as you can keep. Follow the script. We have a script for just about everything. And they're up on the web page. There are also any SOPs. If you have to temporarily write one, keep it as short to the point as possible. The less wordy, the better. You notice when you check in on the Oxcom net, do I ever come back and go, net control is pleased to recognize whoever? <laughs> short and sweet. WS4NC, Roger out. He just checked in. Nothing more needs to be said. Remember the precedence, operational, emergency operational need, priority out the welfare and team. Speak clearly, normal tone of voice, good mic techniques. <coughs> Make your instructions clear. <coughs> Mark, I need you to go down here. That, go down the street. There's a big oak tree on the left. I need you to go down there and stand by that big oak tree. Problem is, it's no pine street. Am I giving them a good, clear instruction? Now, if I say, Mark, I need you to go down this oak line street and stand by the sixth tree on the left, is that a good, clear instruction? Yes. Yeah. Tell them specifically where to go. Keep notes. Please keep notes. Don't let your log fall behind. You may be so tied up that all you can do is scribble your notes down mm -hmm. and you have a moment, transcribe it neatly to the log. Mm -hmm. Remember, other people have to read this. <laughs> the next net controller, the person three shifts down who comes back to because they're asked the question, when did message 305 get sent? They got to go back through the log and say, okay, let's see, message 305 was set this date this time. If they can't read that, they're not going to be able to answer the answer question. Write down which operators are what locations. Keep it updated. That's resource list. Who's where? That's accountability. Remember, you want to know where people are. I'm eating my thing is breaking up on me. Ask the station to pass their message traffic on the main net whenever possible. The only time I'll send people off frequency is if we are highly busy. <clears throat> and I may do that, for example, if I've got a couple of operational immediates to help keep traffic flow, I may take one and send over to an alternate frequency, let them pass that traffic there. And then continue the one. I like this one. What's this say? True. Uh -huh. sure. yes. Read all you want. You can take all the classes you want. You can study all you want. Until you practice it, until you get some actual experience doing the job. It's meaningless. I had a uh, A girl walk in one day, 
during a safety investigation with an airline that I was with. She was brand new out of college, had not worked a day in her life in the safety field. Walked in and had the audacity to tell me, the NTSB investigator and the FAA investigator, that we had no clue what we were doing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Did not go over very well. I think between between the three of us, we have about ninety years of aviation safety investigation experience. You know, and we collectively probably investigated twenty or thirty accidents. You know, and she came in and said, "You guys have no clue what you're doing." Was this one of your classes? No, this was actually a real world event. She came in representing a little commuter airline and mashed one of their airplanes into one of my big airplanes. I was very happy with the response of the National Transportation Safety Board as an investigator. Not credible? You know what he did? Put his arm on his shoulder. So he come with me. Walked her through the door. <laughs> Out the door, closed it. Came back. So let's continue on. <laughs> she was excluded from the investigation. We didn't even bother trying to teach her. <clears throat> we, just, like, we don't have time for this. We brought her back in later, but we pretty much have been excluded her from the good portion. All right. So look for the opportunities. And when can you get good chances to do it? Every Thursday night. Every Thursday night. How about tour to Tanglewood? Do you think that the people that are normally in that control might want to take a break? No. 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 Yeah. no? <laughs> they might. It might be good to have a third person in that control. Why? Because it gives them a controller chance to go sit down for a bit and wait for the radio. Go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom. Take a break. They can go to vac it's on vacation during the twelve time Yeah. Okay. <coughs> when we do exercises with emergency management, with the IMT, with other organizations, whatever, we'll roll in, for example, up here when we just did one on Wednesday. There was a half a dozen comments sitting there. Now, do you think that one of them sat there and ran as a comel all day long for all three days? No. Oh, well, these guys were bouncing off. One ran a program for three <coughs> hours, and then he took a break, and the other one ran it for three hours. And, and they kind of worked through each other, so everybody got a little experience. They got a chance to play. That's what we want to do. We want to give everybody an opportunity to play. Well, some people might not want to do Thursday nights because they're scared of you. Because they're what? Fairly new? No, scared of you. Oh, scared of me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I oh, think a lot of people could see that. <laughs> <laughs> you told me I did a good job after the first time. Hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it was only after the first time he said that. Well, that's true. The second time. Was you obviously <laughs> haven't seen my, my OXCOM ID. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Oh, he's a cute. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Harlan. <laughs> By the way, Grumpy Cat died. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. He did not. No. Yeah. 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 Doesn't mean I won't pull you aside afterwards and we sit down and have a constructive yeah. chat. Okay? But I'm not going to walk up and pound on the table and go, you did this, 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 this. I'm not going to do that. We're going to talk about it. What can we do to make it better? Because trust me, if you're new with this and you're starting out, you're going to make mistakes. And I can guarantee you 40 years ago I made the mistakes. I'm not where I am because I didn't make mistakes. I'm where I'm at because I made mistakes. Experience is making a mistake and living through it. That's called experience. So you're going to make a mistake. That's fine. Make it now when we're training. 
Make it now when lives do not depend on it. Because when lives depend on a day, it's time to make that mistake. That's when we've got to have it right. So the work I work with you as long as you work with me. Interference issues. Do we get interference? I don't know why that does that. It's saving, it's auto saving file. Is it auto saving? I must have a stone on that. Um, yes, we get interference. Do we get interference on the air? Absolutely. Yeah. All the time. Mm -hmm. What you got, Oh, nothing. But I was thinking that was interference. Just that was interference, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we get interference. It can be natural. It can be semi-man-made, which I mean, it could be from another radio source that's mixing with another radio <coughs> source and getting into our repeater or on our, on our frequency intermodal type of stuff. Or we can get intentional. Does that happen in disasters and emergencies? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It happens here. And it's miserable when it happens. The key thing is, don't recognize it. Don't sit there and go, hey, well, the person jacking off in a frequency stop. Okay? Stop. What, what are they going to do when you do that? Make it worse. They're going to make it worse, because why? They know they're getting to you. They know that it's happening. They, they if you continue happening. on like nothing's going on as best you can, they're eventually going to stop. If they don't, what do we have? Alternate frequencies. And we're going to talk about those in a bit and how we do that. HF, just move a few kilohertz away. If you cannot solve the issue, if it continues, record it, date time, actual recording, audio recording, if you can make that happen. Let me know, because I will let others know that have equipment that can start monitoring. Every radio out there, how many people have Bofang radio? Pretty much everybody got a little Bofang radio, right? Do you realize each of those Bofang radios have a signature? Mm -hmm. We all have the same model, but they each have their own individual signature, just like fingerprint. And people that have the, tech, the equipment, the tech equipment, they can figure that out. Now, they may not be able to tell it's your radio until they get close enough to you and you transmit, and they can kind of put two and two together. But they can lead to that point, and that's how they track it down. Don't they? Every radio really has a signature. And uh, we have had some interference problems, and I have equipment in my shop. And if, some, if there is a problem going on in the repeater, give me a call so we can turn it on. I can identify the exact subaudible tone frequency, the exact modulation deviation on various radios, and we can track down who it is. And we have tracked down people. Mm -hmm. So don't think you're anonymous. You're not. Right. And like if Don's one of them, I wasn't going to point you out. <laughs> um, we do have we do have several that we have access to, and they can do that. So I have a DF unit that I can throw in the truck, so I can DF to your location once I get on the transmit frequency and pick you up. Well, if I can hear you on the input frequency, I can DF to you. That's direction finding. Well, I can cruise around and find you. Would you do say, that in case of, I mean, if you're doing it in emergencies? No, probably not. Probably I'm just going to record it, try to get Don or somebody on the air to listen, and <clears throat> try to identify as best we can from there, because we have too many other things going on. But in the end, if they don't stop, and if we find out who it is, and we tell them to stop, and they still don't stop, where does it go? FCC. And Riley Hollingsworth, who's retired now, is a club member of this club. He went to Wake Forest Law School. And he knows everybody by name. We found that. The trouble. We always want a written report. Yes. And. This is not the email address. I don't know why that came into an at symbol. It's supposed to be 18, but it's areas at W4NC.com. 
and it comes straight to me. Alright. See, we're ahead of time, aren't we? Like I said, there's only 36 more chapters to go. We're good again. Alright, let's talk a little bit about net control. Because everybody here could essentially be a net control station. Even though you may not have gone through the EOC net controller, which is geared towards the EOC operation, you can be tasked with being a net controller. It's formal directed net. Means you're in control. Okay, we already talked about traffic clock. Your skills are critical. Practice, 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 practice. I can't stress that enough. If you want to listen to Thursday night net, listen to any other large-scale event or large-scale net that has a lot of people checking in in the early phase. Try to copy down, write down the call signs as they come in. That's good practice. Tune in your ear. Field day would be a good day to do that. Field day could be a good day. Get out there and listen to the people calling in that are, you know, when you call CQ and you get a half a dozen people or a pile dog piling on you because they want the contact. You got to pick one out. And you might want to write down a couple others so you go back to them after you get the contacts made. But any net, you can go on HF, listen to the Tar Hill Emergency Operations <coughs> net, you listen to ours, listen to traffic net, uh, any of them. Gives you an idea of how a directed net works. The bag of my rag shoe net is not necessarily the best one because it's a rag shoe net. It operates totally different. Even though it's directed, it operates totally different. You're right, it is. But listen, try to, tr try to copy down the stations. And once you learn people, 90% 90, 90 of the time I will have, when you're checking on on the Oxcom net, I will have already written your call sign down before you get it out. Because I recognize the voice. <clears throat> so I know who it is. Start writing it down. You will get there. And you need to get there. And the only way you're going to get there is through practice. Do what? I was just saying I can tell Mike out and you. Uh, it just varies. All right. We need a net control station anytime we go into a more formal type of operation. When we have more than just a couple of people on on the system, on the net, we need to go into a net control. We need to start controlling the frequency. If we're in an emergency operation or in a public service event, why do we want to control the frequency besides having our own folks under control? Is it keeps the outside folks under control. Usually once they hear it's a directed net that's being operated on the, on the frequency, they'll go somewhere else. They leave us alone. <clears throat> There's only a couple of people in the area that want to become pains. We know who they are. We routinely work with them. And for the most part, we give them just a moment to, to get it out of their system and then they do them. And a couple of you know who I'm talking about. All right. We're going to talk about most of this. Some of this is duplication. You know, as a net evolves, as it grows, Think about Tour de Tangle. Tour de Tangle last year had 32 people working in, 36 people working in that. We had 32 radio operators out in the field. Not a lot of people. We had rest stops, we had motors, we had logistics. We had a lot of people running around there. Would it have been beneficial to run two nets? Put our mobiles over on one, put all our rest stops on another? Mm. Could have been. Could have been. And we may actually try that this year. Just to see how it works, number one. Number two, 
to give people what? Practice, experience. So would that require another person in that control? Yeah. Yeah. Probably require two. One to log and one to talk and then they swap off. Because trust me, the two people last year that were working, they were working. They were working hard. Good opportunity to practice and play. And learn what you need to learn. So we always think about going more than one net. Remember we showed you all the different nets? Traffic net, resource net, tactical net. We could theoretically have three, four, five nets open depending on the scale of the event. Go ahead. Hmm? Relays normally happen on simplex operations and on HR. Very rarely on a repeater operation do you have to relay. Why? Because everybody's going to hear the same station. Well, we had another situation that had a lot more That was a simplex operation. Yeah. And, yeah, when you have a simplex operation, there's going to be relays. When you have an HF operation, there's going to be relays. Okay? Um, I can barely, on HF, I can barely hear you on numbers. And the reason is, you're here, I'm here, my antenna is oriented this way. So you're coming off the side of my antenna. And, and your antennas are kind of oriented this way. Yeah. So I'm really kind of giving up just a little bit. So you're very, very weak for me. But you are real strong to stay direct. And so if I can't hear you, and I actually, if you listen, I had to ask him if you were done. When you make comments, yeah, they, they I couldn't them. hear. So I had to ask him if he was done. Okay, that would be a relay. Simplex operations the same way. As everybody knows, you can't necessarily hear direct. It may have to go through a couple of people. It's very simple. That control can ask if there's any relays. Remember, you may have to hear that operation. Simplex or non-repeater operations. Who in here has gone through the sky more in training? Everybody raise your hand. You are official sky operators. And you know what to tell. <clears throat> Remember during a watch phase, not a whole lot's happening. We're just kind of gathering information. We may, and it is at the direction of either the EC or the assistant EC, based upon what we're seeing, we may call up a weather net. We may just go ahead and activate an informal weather net in the watch phase to pull. Who's out there? What's your availability should this really get tough? But we're also looking at what information we're getting from National Weather Service as to what the pattern in the previous counties was for the storm. What's it looking like? Now, we got a hurricane watch out. What's that give us? Gives us days, right? Doesn't give us three hours. It gives us days to prep, to prepare, get everything ready, make sure we got all our ducks in a row. We got a lot of time there. But you can go from a tornado watch to a tornado warning in 45 minutes. More quick. So in those instances, we may go ahead and stand up a weather now. See who's out there, see what's going on, find out what we're seeing. Because our information that we gather and we report to the National Weather Service may be able to upgrade. And it might just be that we've got a severe thunderstorm watch. But we've got that thunderstorm occurring right now, and we're seeing some bad stuff. <clears throat> and we provide that information to the weather service, and all of a sudden the tornado watch comes out based upon what we're seeing. Or it might even go to a tornado warning if we're seeing what? Okay. Funnel we report that funnel cloud where they had no idea or thought that this was going to happen. Now it's all it's instantaneously into the tornado warning. 
But not all funnel clouds touch the ground. Not all. But there's always that possibility. So if you've got a funnel cloud, what do they want to do? They want to get their warning out. Seek shelter now. Because that, it could touch ground. It might bound, it might go back up, come down 15 miles away. But if they want to get that information out. They want to know that that's what's occurring. Holland, <clears throat> yep. question. The training we went through two months ago, mm -hmm. did we get some kind of certificate for that? Or yeah, at that? the bottom of the page, the bottom of the back page that you had, the handout that they gave you, mm -hmm. is a website to go to and the password to get into it. It'll pull up your certificate, put your name in it, and the date, turn it out. Do not give out the password, Scott. I mean, <laughs> oh, it's it's got it down. Anyway, I won't give you the website, but if you don't have that shit, um, I will get it to you. All right. So, how important is it to have a well-trained net control operator? <laughs> Anybody listen to a poorly run net? If you haven't, they're out there. Trust me. Dial around. You'll hear them. You will hear them. There you go. How about where a net controller loses his cool? The alienates have to match numbers. Uh, you replace them. I have heard net controllers get on the air and actually go, we all shut the hell up. I'll call you when I'm ready. Whoa. Whoa. It happens. When that occurs, huh. what do you think people do? Turn the radio on. Do I want to work with that individual? <laughs> no. Probably not. Okay, I'm not going to sit here and be abused remotely over the radio while volunteering my time in the middle of this disaster when I could be home hugging the kids, petting the dog, kicking the wife. Okay. Yeah. You don't want to abuse people. All right. How about if they're not organized? I'll forget it. The message is getting lost, getting, lost, yes. getting messed up, not transmitted right. All these things. So having a trained operator, who's trained operators? Measure. Measure. I know it's after lunch. We'll do jumping jacks here in a little bit to get everybody's blood flowing. All right, the value of the net control operator skill is unquestionable. Remember, you may be sitting in a room next to a public safety professional communicator, a dispatcher for fire department, EMS, law enforcement. You might be sitting right next to them. What's going to happen if you don't sound professional, if you ain't got your stuff together in one basket? I'll never trust you. Might throw you off. Well, they, they don't necessarily have the authority, but they know people that do. Call you text back And if they can sit there later on and go, you know what? That Aries Oxcom guy that was sitting working next to me, they had no clue. They were so lost. Please don't put them next to us again. What's going to happen in the next operation? They're not going to be there. Either. Yeah. I will not tell you who was at the state EOC, but I, during during one of the op things, I was I was watching the Oxcom page, <coughs> and I think I've got a little less here here, uh, because more than once I had to turn around and go, da. What they were being asked to do was relatively simple. They received the message via, quote, amateur radio. It was given to them over the phone from the SIM cell, which we're playing as remote amateur radio folks. So they give them this message. It's on ICS-213. It's what it was supposed to come in on. Because I looked at the SIM cell message, and it was transmitted over the telephone to them exactly as it would have been from the 213. They scribbled it on a sheet of paper about like that, just a scrap piece of paper. 
And then they were trying to figure out, what do we do with this now? Where do we put it? What do we do with it? How do we direct it to who? <clears throat> and I'm like, I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh. It's a request for 50 shelter kits. It's just not that taxing. Where's that go? Goes to logistics. Who will then put in the what's called a 213 RR, which is a resource request, and that will get transmitted over to the purchasing group, who will ensure that that item gets purchased or pulled out of the warehouse, goes back to logistics, and that would come back to them to transmit back. They're going. Well, let's see. Would we? I mean, they're, we got this, and they said it came over amateur radio, but. Who do we, do, what do we do with it? How do we work it? And I'm going, you guys are at the state of the OC. Oh my God, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. Okay. It took them probably half hour, 45 minutes to finally figure out what to do with it. Then I'm watching them put it in to Web EOC, <coughs> which is a system that goes in at the EOC plus ours. We do the same <coughs> thing. And two of them. And they're both trained on that is. And they're, where do I put this here? How do I put this? Where do I word this? And they're actually, as they're putting this message in, making comments in the message text as to how it was received and all the information. And I'm going, oh my gosh, this is nowhere close. And of course, that was one of the, it didn't wasn't a fail point, but it was one of the comment points at the end of the exercise. Um, if we're in the EOC, mm -hmm. are you given the famous 213 or the ARRL message forms or messages? We, we, will, we could possibly have to use both. I mean, is it given to them? Are they there to use it? So no, they should, be, they should be part of your go kit. Okay. They should be part of your deploy kit. Okay. We haven't gotten to the point of stocking up there yet, but we will. That's one of the things on the to-do list that right now is as long as it's built. So, it'll get there. The 213 is in the Web EOC for those that are Web EOC qualified. And the people that go downtown as a communications team lead to the EOC must have the Web EOC training. You have to have that to be a team lead. All right. The best well-run nets, that's going to up our game. That's going to make people look at us as what? Professional communicators. If we ain't got our stuff together, it's going to be quickly shown. I want to give you some examples as we talk about this. I know Justin's been to the Oxcom course down in Charlotte. I know he also got Commel. And I've been to the Oxcom course, going through the Commel course. At all for that certification. Anybody else been to Oxcom? Okay. Give me an idea how this works. The beginning of the week, the COMELs come in to train along with what we call COMTs. COMELs are the communications lead part people, COMTs are the technical people. Those are the nuts and bolts folks. Okay, they spend a week practicing putting RJ45s on cables. I, I say that, but they do a whole lot more. But they actually do practice that. All right. At the end of the week, that Friday, it, the Oxcom folks come on Wednesday. It's Comels, Comtees, Oxcom. But that Friday, all of those teams, all those people, plus we have radios, radio operators, they come in. They're the tactical dispatchers. Um, they come in, and they're learning that part of it. At the end of the week, we've not interfaced at all throughout the week. We may have seen each other at lunches, but we haven't really interfaced. At the end of the week, they take however many of us and they throw us together. Your team, here's your Tom L's, usually two to three of them, and your Tom T's and your Oxcom and your Rados. Here's your team, Tom L. Have fun. 
you got to establish your communications and they give you injects. They ask questions. You got to answer them. Everybody gets tasked with something, including Oxcom. And you got to have the answers. You're out in the field. Okay? We had a team, one team was in, you know, one team was had a great slot. They were in Charlotte <coughs> Mecklenburg's 53 foot tractor trailer mobile command post. Air conditioned, nice and plush, all pretty. Team sitting right next to them were working out of an 8 by 12 pull behind trailer with an awning that was facing the sun. And they baked. You know, while the trailer had air conditioning, it could only handle about three to four people in the trailer at a time. So it wasn't a very, op very good operation for them. And then there were things in between. But they all had the same scenarios. They all had the same things they had to want, run through, the same injects. You know, I'm sitting next to our evaluator. We were outside. Thankfully, our trailer was facing away from the sun. So we were relative comfort. And uh, he looks over at the Tom L. And he goes, I need to know the frequency for FRS channel 11. Our poor Comel kind of looked like it, okay? You can tell that number one, that went right here. And he's like, I have no clue how we'll figure this out. So he turns around to Com T. He says, I need you to figure this out. In the meantime, I've got my hand held. Dialed over the FRS 11. Went from nomenclature to frequency. And I, hey, come out. Come here. Right here. Here's your frequency. Oxcom's useful, right? We had an answer. That's where you come in. That right there, I'll tell you, at the end of the exercise, between me and the other Oxcom participant that was on our team, that Comel, who happened to be the communications director for his county, the emergency communications director for his county, and we were working out of his trailer. He looked at us, he says, what do I got to do to get you two guys there? And I said, let me hook you up with the people in your county. He said, you tell me how. I said, I'll get a hold of you, I'll give you who they are, and I said, because you've got an active unit there, we'll get you hooked up with the right phone. So we did. They have now rebuilt. They've got a larger trailer. And guess who's included in that trailer? Amateur radio. We've got a fire, fire and EMS dispatcher, law enforcement dispatcher, box gun. Right there in the trailer. Three positions. That's how impressed he was with our functions. One of our functions was to make a make voice contact with State EOC, Viper Systems in Operating. Or Tom L and Tom T were there. Don't know how to do that. It's like I did. I know so. Dialed up the HF, got it to where it needed to be. And all because they had a HF unit in the truck called State EOC. Did a radio check with them and checked that block. Hmm. Capabilities that they didn't even think about. He had a unit in the truck or in the trailer, but he didn't even think that that's what it was for. Oh, I'll, I'll never think what they got that for the state stuff, but they marked it 24 hours ago. They're not on that one. They're up on, I got it down somewhere. Um, well, it should be on the top of my mind. I don't know. I didn't think we got it on that other morning. I've got it dialed in on my radio. Well, that's what I say there's a week that gets on that every morning. Yeah. But it's there. They they have the ability to monitor it. It's also the primary window. Frequency. So you can always get to it. 
It does radio stay up 24 hours. In fact, there's a big sign right at those radios. Do not turn off. And right below that it says, do not change frequency. <laughs> they want you to know, don't mess with that radio. All right. <clears throat> I like this statement. You must have the ability to absorb new terminology quickly. There's no more fertile environment for the growth of jargon than an emergency management community. And trust me, that is correct. Every training course you go to, they're going to talk about not using acronyms. What happens when we're out <laughs> is acronym city. Okay? I mean, it's insane, but that's the way it ends up being. So you're going to learn, learn new words. And I'm not talking about the four-letter type. You're going to learn a whole ton of new jargon that you never thought existed. So it's kind of good. Question for you is, do you have the right stuff? Do you have what it takes? What do you mean by a mouthful of marbles won't do? So four more mouthful of marbles won't do. If you can run the drive-through, <laughs> you can understand. You be a good night controller. <laughs> Even if you ask if you have, would you like an apple pie with that? Clear speaking voice. If you talk through a mouthful of marbles, if you got that wad of chewing tobacco in your mouth, okay, or bubble gum, or the candy, or whatever, remember your mom told you don't talk in your mouth. There you go. <clears throat> Fluency in language. People with thick accents are really hard to understand on the radio. If you want to listen to hear that, dial up the med channels here in the county. Huh. You will hear some folks we have with EMS and all, and they're great paramedics, they're great medics, they're, they're all good people, but they have some of the thickest accents. You know, because we did a big hiring spree, spree for a bunch of bilingual folks because we have a very good Spanish population or Hispanic population in the county now. So they needed that. So they did a big hiring spree for that within EMS. And you can tell that when you listen to them mm -hmm. when they're transporting the patient to the hospital. Sometimes I'm going, how in the world is that nurse writing down what they're telling them? Because the accent is so thick. And you hear the nurse come back. Repeat that again. You know, repeat the blood pressure, repeat the fault, whatever. As a person who talks to multilingual people, I have people I work with who are from India, mm -hmm. from China, and I get them on the same conference bridge. Uh, you can develop a, what I call a musician beer. Mm -hmm. For the way those dialects sound, mm -hmm. I'd recommend you practice listening to foreign countries because English is the universal language of ham radio, right? So if you go listen to the Italians and the Spanish, you should be better to it will help you with that because you have to. We need, as debt controls, I would think we would need to develop an ear to be able to adjust to that dialect. And it's not necessarily easy, it took a lot. Mm -hmm. What you think about here in the United States? Well, my accent's um, bad enough. Okay. Yeah. You get somebody from Jersey, oh, you get somebody from Long Island. Or Alaskan? Or Alaskan. West Coast, Alaskan. Some people out of Texas. Hell, some people out of North Carolina. How about up in Maine? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I like Charlie. Hey, Curtis don't, don't the maniacs. You get, you get the different, you know, while we're all speaking English, we got the different tones and dialects, the way we're talking, and it can be a challenge. Did you notice at lunch, we're in an Italian restaurant, whether it's Cantonese music on the yes. system? Yes. Yes. Might my mother be now. So remember, you got to speak clearly. Hopefully, you were talking to speaking clearly, and you're able to communicate. I couldn't understand the word that person was 
The key thing is we don't want to keep having people to repeat things. Right. Can you handle the mental and physical stress for long periods? Remember, we're talking about potential 12-hour shift. That's a long time. So what are you supposed to do? You bring your own potty with you or something? I mean... I'm being serious. Ninety percent of the time, you're going to be in a location where there's going to be facilities. Now, it may not be anything more than a port job, but there's going to be something provided. Very, very rarely, you're going to have to go out and get a sweat trench. I just have to ask. I'm not being serious. Um, I would suggest making sure you have a couple rolls of toilet paper, however, in your go kit. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> Well, number one, Oakley's make for substitutes, so did our bills. Yeah. That's really the wrong one. Right? No matter what is going on around you, can you handle what's going on and keep your voice and composure? The key thing to a good net controller is maintaining a calm, steady voice at all times. If you want to listen, and they're out there, they're not supposed to be, but they are. There are crash recordings from commercial aircraft. You want to listen to people keeping their cool all the way to impact? Listen to them. The United, or the American Airbus that went down right after 9-11 in Jamaica Bay. Oh. I listened to that recording when the actual investigation was going on. And that crew sat there, and the captain said, okay, that's not working, let's try this. Now this airplane's coming out of the sky, it's kind of like this, pointed straight down, because they lost the tail. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was no recovery on that airplane, they knew they were going down, but they're calmly trying this, that, whatever. Just a calm tone of voice. You could tell they were restrained. But there was no excitement, no yelling, no screaming. The last thing you heard on them was I love this one. Who did the test the listen to? Professional. They kept their composure, even though they knew they were going to die. You're not going to die sitting in an EOC or a forward command post, hopefully, or out in the field. So you should be able to keep your composure, but some people don't. They get caught up in the moment. We need to train ourselves to maintain that composure. We've got to be able to think and act in seconds. Make decisions under pressure, because sometimes you will have to make a decision. <coughs> when you've got somebody that's been sent out to monitor the dam, hopefully they're up stream, of the dam. It doesn't make any sense. I want you to go make sure this dam's not going to break, by the way. I want you a quarter mile downstream. That's probably not the best place to put them, right? No. Because what's going to happen when that dam breaks? What are you going to hear on the radio? Well, it's up to my way from right. <laughs> <laughs> and I see the wall coming. <laughs> the water is coming. You the dam broke. The dam broke. problem. Where, you know, the difference is if he's downstream, you get the dam broke. If he's upstream, you get, hey, y'all, dam just broke. You might want to tell people downstream. Okay? okay? Composure, non composure. You may have to make a decision based upon what your person in the field is telling you. If they've told you something, and in your view as a net controller, they're in a dangerous situation that they may not realize, you got to make a decision. Get them out of Dodge. Tell them to get in shelter. Tell them to get wherever they need to be. To get protected. So you have to make that decision. And that sometimes is required in that controller. Making that immediate decision. So you've got to have situational awareness at all. Also. Good seconds count. Seconds are the difference between life and death. Listen and comprehend in a very noisy, chaotic environment. Oh my gosh. I'm telling you folks. EOCs get that way. Forward command posts get that way. It gets crazy. 
you got to tune out the distractions. Can, can you do that? Can you multitask and tune out the distractions? Yeah. You ever tune out your spouse? Hmm. Good practice. Never. 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 Rod's like, oh, uh uh. I, I know, I said I would never admit that ever. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, tune out the kids, tune out whatever. Okay? Because you got to get things done. If you have hearing loss, I would suggest to you that that control is not a good place for you. Especially for one in HF operations. And the reason is you will miss things. You will miss certain things that might be critical. You know, however, if you are digitally capable and you are very good at digital operations, we can use you as a net control station for a digital net. Still doesn't mean you're not useful. It means you're very useful. But that is a suggestion. If you have good and severe hearing loss, it makes it tough to be in that control. I'm, I'm just going to say not necessarily for hearing loss, but where it's kind of noisy and stuff in the background, somewhere I was studying or reading or something, it suggested using a headset. Yes. Headphones. Headphones always help. If you've got a headphone, if you've got a headphone mic capable set up, you can use a head, full headset, even better. Because those situations free up your hands because you're using a foot pedal to transmit. You just got to remember when you're sitting back, relaxing, humming a tune, don't tap that foot. Because <laughs> what happens when it goes up, down, up, down, up, and down to the beat. Okay. Legibly write what you hear as you receive it. Can you write without having to look at the paper? Yes. Can you type it if you're typing it in without having to look at the computer screen? Right? Yes. Okay. Don't rely on your memory because I guarantee you're going to forget it. In an emergency situation, as much information that you're going to get, try to put that in, the, in their memory and say, I'll, trans I'll translate it here when I get done talking to them. You're going to start writing it down and go, you got to hear now. What was after that? It's going to happen. Write it down as it happens. Okay? Hopefully you have above average knowledge on operating skills. Most of you do. If not, the bottom comes into play. Practice, practice, practice. Let's keep it going. <coughs> transferable skills. Most of the skills you use daily is transferable. You can use them as you need to go through. For example, most of you know what type of antenna to put up with a two meter rig, right? You gonna put a 120 foot dipole up for two meters? No. Are you gonna put a Herald Special J pole up for 70 or for uh, 80 meters? No. Probably not. You know what to put up. You know what works. Okay. You probably know your radios pretty good, so you by now learn how to do what? Get the best audio quality out of your microphone. So when you transmit, people can hear you. You know how to program your radio. If you're like me, who has a bunch of radios, and from a bunch of different manufacturers, and no manufacturer, even within their own radios, makes them all program the same way. I've got two, two Yezu handhelds, and trust me, they do not program the same way. you think for simplicity they'd make it that way, but they don't. Instead, I have this. It's got all the software for every radio. I've got all my cables in here. I can field program all my radios. Okay, so I don't have to keep that jogged in memory. And I've also got all the manuals in there. Provided that works, then I've got power, I'm good to go. If it doesn't, as long as this has power, I've got all my manuals on that. So I can pull them up and manually program them. Trying to learn to program your radio in an emergency is not the time to learn your radio. Okay. 
be amazed when working auto accidents how many times I heard people tell me that I didn't realize my vehicle had this particular ability, whatever it was. And then my question was, did you read the owner's manual? Well, no, I didn't. But yet they punched, they, they, they were parked to get ready to pull into a parking spot and they punched the, the button on their dash for auto park and the vehicle decided to parallel park itself into another vehicle. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Kind of cool. Anyway, understand propagation. Who knows what that term means? Everybody? Right now we have, what, relatively poor propagation going on in the HF plant. So we're lucky at times we can hear across the street. Okay. We need to understand that. We need to understand that at some points of the day, 80 meters might not be that good, but 20 might be better, or vice versa. Okay. We might need to understand that we just need to disregard HF altogether and do the best we can on UHF, VHF, 270 centimeters, and do as many relays as we need. You know, could I get to state EOC without HF? Sure. I can get there. It might have to relay through a couple of repeaters unless I can get to one of the Carolina Link repeaters or the Carolina Link system, the 440 Link. But that'll only work if they have linked them all up to the state EOC from my section. They don't do that all the time. That's actually controlled um, through the state EOC out there. They control that. And they link up what repeaters they need, whether it's east or west or central only, depending on what the event is. Hurricanes, they link up the east back to the EOC. So we can't get access. So how would I have to do? Well, I might have to go into Greensboro, talk to one of their people in Greensboro off their repeater, who then relays out to Burlington, who then relays into somewhere closer to Raleigh Durham, who then relays into the EOC. Can we get it done? Yeah, it's not pretty, but we get it done. How about your contesting skills? Who contests them? In? Anybody play contesting? Okay. Those skills become very applicable. Okay, because what are you doing in contesting? Contacting people. You're working fast, right? Same thing in emergency operations. You're working fast. You're having to listen, pick out, and you're actually making choices. Good training. All right. Let's see. You want to move as much traffic as possible in the least amount of time, accurately and effectively. Accuracy is a key term. Okay, before we jump in there, we've been back almost 50 minutes. Give everybody a five minute break. And I'll use the restroom, whatever. If the stretch gets some blood flow, then we'll not be sounding. Oh. 